Did you know that history is a product of the present? This idea is at the core of all written history. In this lecture, I'm going to explain this concept and then use a case study from Canadian history to show how it influences our understanding of church history. I'll be focusing on Canadian Baptists, a group that does not embrace the idea of saints held by Roman Catholics. However, they have often looked to the past for inspiration and to renew their sense of identity. The case study will consider how they did this and will demonstrate how we look to past figures for inspiration. First, I should probably introduce myself. My name is Adam Rudy. I'm married to Kirsten and we have an eight-month-old daughter named Melian. Last spring, I completed my PhD at MDC under the guidance of Dr. Gord Heath. And since then, I've been fixing automated irrigation systems and working on a church history podcast. So let's begin by defining history. In English, the word history can refer to at least three different things. In one usage, it refers to the past, that which has already happened. A second usage refers to what is written about the past. For example, when asked what books you have to read for this class, you might say, without enthusiasm, history books. A third usage refers to the academic discipline of history. Thus, for example, you might tell your friends and family that you've decided to major in history for your bachelor's degree. Since English uses the same word for all of these different meanings, it can be unclear what exactly we mean when we're talking about history. Let's consider the first usage for a minute, history as the past. The past is, by definition, gone. While we in the present face the consequences of what has happened in the past, the past itself is irrevocably beyond our reach. We have what is often called historical evidence, such as laws, handwritten letters, scrolls, books, and artifacts. However, these are not bearers of the past. They have no meaning in and of themselves. They have to be interpreted. And this means that history, and now I'm referring to what is written about the past, history is fundamentally an interpretive enterprise. History, as it is written, is, in a very real sense, created by us in the present rather than the people of the past or their records. The act of interpretation brings the past and present together, completing a cycle of mutual formation. The present, indelibly shaped by the past itself, inevitably shapes interpretations of the past. Now let's not pretend that this concept doesn't have a host of complex questions attached to it. It certainly does. But I have simplified the idea, and I think in its simple form, it remains helpful as we think critically about church history. Now let's move into a case study. <clears throat> in 1967, Canada celebrated its centennial anniversary. In the midst of the celebrations that year, the denominational newspaper of the Baptist Convention of Ontario and Quebec, called the Canadian Baptist, reflected on Canada's past and Baptist's contribution to it. In doing so, the newspaper printed a column called Baptist Biographies. This column considered six Canadian Baptist figures who had made strong contributions to the growth of Canadian Baptists. The first step in understanding how the present shapes the past, for this case study, is considering historical context. Other than the centennial celebrations of 1967, what context did Central Canadian Baptists find themselves in? <clears throat> well, these Baptists had been in Canada a long time, since the middle of the 18th century, in fact. Over time, they grew. They were especially popular in rural areas in the early 19th century. And it was during the 19th century that a curious process began. Baptists in Ontario and Quebec grew in number. More churches, more and larger associations. They attempted to attain greater unity. The formation of the Canada Baptist Union in 1843 was a transient but important step in the journey toward greater unity. In addition to cautionary movements towards unity, Central Baptists devoted time and resources to establishing educational and training institutes for prospective Baptist clergy, and efforts were made to establish a denominational newspaper. By 1854, the paper that would later be known as the Canadian Baptist had been established. The widespread influence of evangelicalism among Baptists, as well as a deep missionary impulse, 
helped to break down barriers between Baptists and facilitated greater unity amongst the numerous associations in Ontario and Quebec. In 1888, the Baptist Convention of Ontario and Quebec was formed. What was curious, though, was that these signs of growth seemed to correlate with the trend towards what historians have termed respectability or social legitimacy, characteristics that Baptists' nonconformist ancestors had lacked. Thus, as the 19th century progressed, uh, Central Canadian Baptists became more respectable, more middle class in outlook, and increasingly identified with the other major English speaking Protestant denominations. <coughs> In the years following Confederation, Baptists realized, in tandem with Anglicans, Presbyterians, and Methodists, the other major Protestant groups who together constituted half of Canada's population, that they had both an opportunity and a responsibility to shape this new nation of Canada. They sought to build this nation into a beacon of the Kingdom of God. Baptists, along with other Protestants, created and supported things like temperance societies and missionary societies, and they used their newspapers to influence public opinion. The churches were very successful in their work. For all practical purposes, Canada was a Christian nation in the last part of the 19th century and for a good chunk of the 20th century. By the time the 1960s rolled around, the idea of Canada as a Christian country was beginning a long death. The 20th century had seen the fracturing of evangelicalism by the opposing forces of theological liberalism and fundamentalism, which affected Canadian Baptists worse than any other Protestant group in Canada. In addition, there were two world wars, an extreme economic depression, the rise of communism in the Cold War, and the crumbling of the British Empire had all taken their toll. The common outlook on nation building that had so shaped much Protestant work had lost its currency. Canadian society had changed and was headed into a brave new world. The idea of Canada as a Christian nation, which had guided so much Baptist engagement with society, appeared more and more unlikely as Canadian society seemed to move in a different direction. <coughs> Baptists had internal problems too. Central Canadian Baptists, uh, their numbers relative to Canada's population had been declining steadily for decades. A schism between modernism and fundamentalism in the convention in the late 1920s had seen a large number of churches leave and form their own denomination. Together with the realization that the Baptist expression of Christianity did not appear to interest many Canadians, Canadian Baptists had begun to question their identity. This came to a head in the 1960s when the ecumenical movement gained a great deal of momentum and there were many discussions about denominational mergers and who should be cooperating with whom. These reinforced Baptist's sense of decline and irrelevance. Now, just as Baptists were experiencing this identity crisis, the 1967 centennial occurred. On such a momentous occasion, it's normal to reflect on the past, and the denominational newspaper provided a platform for two key developments. One was commentary on the Baptist contribution to Canada, and Baptist hopes for the future, and the second was a column of Baptist biographies, which summarized the lives and contributions of six Baptist figures from Canadian history. <coughs> Both were acts of interpreting the past on the basis of the present. In particular, the need for Baptists to have a sense of the significance of their own history and contribution to Canada's development. Simultaneously, the need to inspire present-day Baptists with a renewed sense of identity and potential. Let's look at an example of this commentary on Baptist's contribution to Canadian development first. One leader in the convention argued that Baptist values and principles had influenced Canada's historical development and brought Canada to the present. He wrote, quote, We as a Baptist people have been greatly blessed. The Baptist stand for freedom and liberty has borne fruit. Education, business, and government have all been affected by Baptist beliefs, clearly stated and winsomely upheld. Baptists have seen their devotion to Christ, their belief in the Bible, their emphasis on soul competency, their evangelistic zeal, their missionary vision, all provide a goodly heritage into which we have now entered. <coughs> Another article in the denominational paper voiced a hope for Canada's future 
that was rooted in a long-held notion of Christian Canada. It stated, and I quote, May our renewed vision be matched by a deep concern to see our Lord regnant in the life of this land we love. End quote. Both these examples indicate how the nation-building work of the Protestant churches and their goal of establishing a Christian Canada shaped Canadian Baptist reflections on their own past. While the Baptist Biographies column emphasized several aspects of Canadian Baptist history as contributions to Canada's development, this case study will focus on one. Each of the six figures covered in the column were related in some way to Baptist unity and growth. <coughs> the first figure covered in the column was a man named A.V. Timpany. He was the first Canadian Baptist missionary to serve in India under the auspices of the Canadian Baptist Foreign Missionary Society. Timpany's story was one of great success. Upon his, of, excuse me, upon his arrival at the mission in northern India, he baptized 30 people. After six years of ministry, the mission station had over 600 people connected to it. Timpany had established a seminary to train local Indian pastors. He had traveled to over 1,200 villages to share the gospel. And he had baptized over 300 people in one month. These are only a few of his achievements. Sadly, his life was cut short by cholera. However, Timpany was seen as the father of Canadian Baptist overseas missions. His success and the signs of God's favor on his work were symbolic of the Canadian Baptist unity back home that was needed to facilitate such far-flung mission work. Thus, while Timpany was described as an inspiring man worthy of emulation, his work was a reflection on Canadian Baptist steps toward unity. <clears throat> Two of the other figures covered in the column were also missionaries, Robert L. Lenny and Dr. Silas Rand. Their mission fields, however, were closer to home. Robert Lenny was a key figure in the Baptist missionary expansion into the Canadian Northwest. Soon after Confederation, Canadian Protestants sought to spread the gospel in the vast new areas that were now part of their country. Of course, this was partially motivated by a desire to see their own expression of Christianity spread and grow. Lenny went into the Northwest and shared the gospel as Baptists understood it. He established many churches, though he would be on the move every few months in search of new ground. The newspaper noted that despite all of his movement, his memory lived on in Canadian Baptist circles chiefly because of his bright, uh, brief rather, but highly effective pioneering work in the Northwest. <clears throat> Dr. Silas Rand, meanwhile, has been called the Apostle to the Mi'kmaq people. While Lenny and Timpany had been praised for their selfless devotion, hard work, and obedience, Rand was described differently. His piety was of a simple type. One writer described it thus. It was indeed New, Christian, uh, New Testament Christianity. His faith was unbounded, his doctrinal views clear, his devotions habitual. Prayer seemed his native atmosphere. End quote. He devoted most of his life to sharing the gospel with the Mi'kmaq people of the Maritimes. He became so familiar with their language and culture that he was able to translate the New Testament, Genesis, and the Book of Psalms into their language, and he even created a dictionary of their language. The column sought to emphasize Baptist unity by summarizing the lives of these two Baptists who were involved in other parts of Canada. Rand was a Maritime Baptist and remained one until the day he died. Lenny, meanwhile, had played an instrumental role in the growth of Baptists in British Columbia. By reflecting on Rand and Lenny's lives, the column reinforced the idea of interconnectedness and commonalities between Canadian Baptists, regardless of what region they might inhabit. And this fostered a sense of unity with other Baptist groups in Canada. One of the figures covered in the Baptist Biographies column was actually American. His name was David Marks, and his work epitomized Baptist early history in Canada. He was born in New York State to Calvinist Baptist parents. After his conversion as a teenager, though, he embraced the free will Baptist position. By the age of 15, he had become an itinerant preacher, and by the age of 17 was preaching in the province of Upper Canada, which later became Ontario. In 1828, when he was preaching in the city of St. Catharines, over a thousand people turned up to listen. In the column, Marx was remembered most for his role in helping free will Baptists unify. 
and this was seen as a crucial step towards later and greater Canadian Baptist unity. The final two figures covered in the column were both originally from Scotland, John Mockett Cramp and John Gilmore. Gilmore had been a sailor who was captured by pirates. While in captivity, he was exposed to the Baptist position, and after reading the New Testament himself, he became a Baptist. He valued education and really took to heart the need for ministerial education. He came to Canada and devoted a great deal of time and energy into raising funds for a college to train Baptist ministers. Canada Baptist College was born out of his work. Unfortunately, the college fell victim to differences in theological opinion among the groups supporting the college. However, Gilmore worked tirelessly for the cause of Canadian Baptist education. He even donated a large sum of money to the group of Baptists who had effectively caused Canada Baptist College to fall apart, and he supported their subsequent attempt to establish a center for theological education. John Mockett Cramp was called from Scotland to Canada to help with the ailing Canada Baptist College that was begun by Gilmore. After the college's failure, Cramp acted as principal of new of the new Acadia University in Nova Scotia. Cramp faced constant financial failure, but persisted in his efforts to establish a Canadian Baptist educational center. He believed passionately in the importance of education for Baptist clergy. The stories of these six men illustrate the importance of Baptist unity in the development of Canadian Baptists. They also illustrate the importance of education to early Baptists. Education was important both because later Baptists saw it as one of their chief contributions to Canadian development and because establishing theological schools required a great deal of unity and joint effort. <clears throat> but you might be asking yourself, why was unity such a big deal for Baptists? Well, Baptists as a denomination hold to the principle of local church autonomy, which makes them highly decentralized. Now, decentralization prevents abuse of autocratic power and slippage into hierarchy, but it also facilitates bickering and division over minute differences of, differences of position. Similarly, decentralization was also a roadblock to nation building. As Baptists grew in number, they realized that they could be more effective if they could attain some measure of unity. Unity allowed for later and greater Baptist contributions to Canada as a Christian nation. In the 1960s, still recovering from the schism and divisions of the 1920s and needing a renewed sense of identity, the Baptist Biographies column reinforced the value of Baptist unity, showing how unity allowed Baptists to contribute to Canada's development. The biographies confirmed that Baptist unity was not a given and was in fact a hard-won achievement. Only on the basis of this unity had Canadian Baptists been able to make a greater impact on Canada's development. At the beginning of this lecture, I pointed out that interpretations of the past are shaped by the present. Our present circumstances and beliefs invariably influence what we emphasize and give significance to in the past. Canadian Baptists, in a time of identity crisis, division, and decline, emphasized milestones in historical Baptist unity to show that Baptist missional effectiveness depended very much on unity. Similarly, an enduring commitment to nation building meant that unity was seen as a precondition for Baptist contributions to Canadian development. Despite a sense that the Baptist position had become irrelevant to Canadian society in the 1960s, Baptists still wanted to shape the nation. In their minds, though, shaping the nation was not merely the goal of enshrining Christian morality in law, but rather the goal of spreading the gospel throughout the land so that Canada would once again become a beacon of the kingdom of God. Now, we have to consider our own present and how we interpret the stories from the Baptist Biographies column. We live in a Canada that has been mostly de-Christianized, de at least as far as the government and popular culture are concerned. In fact, there have been numerous signs over the last decade that there is growing hostility to Christianity in our society. Most churches in our current context are not trying to build a Christian Canada. 
and our culture is quite different. For example, the fact that there were no women included in the biographies column is likely a source of contention for some. If a similar column was written today, there's a high chance it may not even include any men in it. <clears throat> Can we glean anything from the biographies column when it was clearly written in a different culture and with the motive of building a Christian Canada, a motive that we don't necessarily share? Are the stories of the six figures in the column of any worth today? I believe they are. First, putting aside the motive of nation building, the column shared the stories of six men who followed Christ. Their stories were exemplars of obedience to the Great Commission and following where Christ led them. All of them traveled from their homes to another place or culture for the work of the kingdom, and all of them devoted their life to the work of the kingdom. Surely this is inspiring. Second, these stories are the stories of our brothers in Christ. They are part of the household of the Lord, and they are part of the great cloud of witnesses, both of which are not subject to the constraints of time. They are saints like you and I, and as such, their stories are worth sharing. <clears throat> as for the nation-building motive behind the biographies column, I think we can put that aside and still appreciate the column's attempt to reinforce Baptist unity and identity. Unity has always been a struggle for Protestants in a way that it has not been for Roman Catholics. And I think anything that reminds us of the, of the value of unity is good. Stories that illustrate the potential of a group that is working towards unity and values unity are an encouraging reminder. Obviously, what I've talked about here differs wildly from the theology that shapes Roman Catholic emphases on saints. For Catholics, saints play a significant role in spirituality, whereas for Protestants, and in this case Baptists, they do not. Historical figures are usually appealed to by Protestants for the purposes of inspiration and reinforcing group identity. And in light of this case study, we need to bear in mind how present circumstances shape how and why we remember someone from the past. This does not in any way mean that we should not look to the past for inspiration, or that doing so is wrong. Importantly, it opens up the vault of history to us as we seek to encourage one another in our walk with Christ. Hearing the story of a devoted and hard-working missionary like A.V. Timpany, for example, a story which had apostolic overtones, is inspiring and encouraging to us regardless of the motives that the person writing about Timpany may have held. So, by all means, seek inspiration and encouragement from past Christians. As Dr. Heath likes to say, some of my best friends are dead. There can be much to learn and benefit from those who have gone before us. Well, that's it for me. Thank you for listening. I hope you found this video interesting.